<clears throat> okay, we're good to go, Tom. Thank you. And so welcome everybody to the Tuesday, June 16th, 2020 meeting of the uh, Weatherfield Planning and Zoning Commission. Ryan, would you help us with the roll call, please? Absolutely. Chairman Harley. I'm here. Vice Chair Roberts. Here. <laughs> I am here. Um, remaining members, Mr. Hughes. No, Mr. Oikel is here. here Mr. Yeah. Hammer. Not see. here. Uh, Mr. Humicki. Here. here. Mr. Dean is here. Here. Mr. Silver is here. Here. Mr. Edwards. Here. Ms. Antoniak. I don't believe so. And Ms. Murphy is definitely here. Yeah. Yep. All right. So we have all nine of us. Everybody's participating already. Um, Ryan, would you introduce the first item? Absolutely. Item 3.1, public hearing application 204320Z, Jean Catania, uh, seeking a special permit in accordance with section 3.6 uh, of the Weathersfield Zoning Regulations to install a 16 by 24 shed at 55 Gristmill Road. Thank you. So if the applicant would uh, introduce themselves and then uh, take a few minutes and tell us what you're up to. Okay, thanks. My name is Jean Katania. I reside at 55 Gristmill Road with my wife, Francine. Um, thank you, commissioners, for uh, hearing my application tonight. Uh, basically, what I would like to do is install a 16 by 24 uh, shed uh, on my property. Uh, there is an existing shed there now, which this one will replace it. Um, the shed is built by the barnyard of Ellington, Connecticut. Um, it's a high-end type, uh, type of shed, and it would be uh, located to the rear of the uh, corner lot. It sits approximately 52 feet from the uh, road. Um, and uh, the nearest neighbor on uh, one side of me, because I'm on a corner lot, I'm 21 feet from that. And then the, the rear of the lot I have additional 24 feet behind it. Um, basically, um, you know, I, I turned in the specs to uh, Peter. It's, um, you know, it's a pretty standard type of uh, shed, again, built by Barnyard of Ellington. Um, and um, see, I'm trying to think what else I could tell you. I, I have talked to several of the neighbors that uh, surround me. They have no concerns with it. I haven't heard of anyone that does. Um, but um, that's, that's really it. It would sit on six, uh, six inches of uh, three quarter inch crust, uh, crushed uh, uh, gravel or stone. And um, geez, I don't know what more I could tell you other than that. So, so uh, just to get the facts out there, the, the critical issue is that it's 16 by 24, 384 feet or whatever. And, 384 uh, square feet, Matt, yes. The maximum is typically 200 uh, without having to go through this process. With that, George, did I see you start to talk? You're on mute, George. George, you're on mute. That's unusual, George. I know. <laughs> George, you're on mute. All right. In the mean, in the meantime, was there somebody else who wanted to start while George figures it out? I, I just have two quick Tony. questions, Tom. Sure, Thank Tony. Mr. Catania, will will there be any electrical or plumbing on the site, and will what is the lighting going to look like? Will it encroach on the neighbors at all? No, um, no plumbing on it. Um, you know, eventually down the road, we might put in a couple of plugs in it for, um, you know, if I have to have a light at night to go in it or something like that but uh, no plumbing and it does not encroach on the neighbors whatsoever. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. How big is the present shed? Uh, present shed is uh, 14 by 18. George, George, you wanna? Well, that was my question, what uh, Dan just asked, really. How does it compare to the existing one? Is it twice as big? No, no, uh, George, it's, um, it's two, uh, two feet wider and uh, six feet longer. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's gonna sit exactly where the, uh, where the present one is, 
although, you know, take up a few more feet uh, sure. width and a few more feet length. And you've got a lot of room back there toward the brook, don't you? Oh, yeah. It's, um, and it's, it's downhill. People don't even see, see it sort of if it's sitting back there. Yeah, that's right. We're, we're, very, we're very fortunate. We're on the corner here. It's a beautiful piece of property and uh, it's pushed back far enough where even if you're coming up the street, you really, really can't see it until you're going by it. Not even John Miller can see it, huh? <laughs> I, I didn't hear that, George. What was that? I got to laugh about things. But he, is, he is on the other side of the brook from you, isn't he? <laughs> yes. Yes. I don't think he yeah. could see it. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah, this is Tom Dean calling in. Yes, Tom. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one is, uh, why did you decide to go for a larger size uh, shed? to replace the current shed. And the second question is, and Peter may be able to answer this, um, does, the, uh, does this affect the uh, area of lot coverage uh, uh, restrictions or requirements under the zoning regulations? Does it fall uh, in excess or is it still under the lot coverage restrictions? Those two questions are my questions. So I, I guess I could take the first one and I'll ask Peter for help on the second one. Uh, basically going to something a little bit bigger uh, to store, like we have a um, Christmas uh, sleigh that we put out during the uh, holidays and we really don't want it to get wet. We want to preserve it. Uh, then with patio furniture and lawnmowers, snow blowers, when I say uh, multiple, I mean one, a lawnmower, snowblower, that type of thing. So um, just a little bit more room to move around in and, um, you know, have some extra space. I guess, I guess I could say, as funny as this sounds, you never have enough space, but that's the reason. Uh, and Tom, to answer your other question, um, the uh, slight increase in the square footage does uh, not come anywhere near uh, the uh, maximum lots, lot coverage permitted in that zone. Thank you. That was, that was my assessment too, but I wanted to get it in on the record. Thank you. Other questions? Rich? Nobody else? Okay. Assuming there's nobody else, um, this is a public hearing. So, would you care to make a motion? Motion to close, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Second. It's Rich. Thank you, Rich. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Um, motion on the application itself. I'll make a motion to approve. Uh, Application number 204320Z, Gene Catania. <coughs> I'll second it. I didn't hear any discussion about uh, any requirements or constraints, so it's as presented. All right. Peter, you have anything to say? No? No. <coughs> okay, thank you. All right. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you. So just for the record, I do see Joe has joined us. Um, Joe, we had nine, you make 10. So for this one anyways, we won't have you, okay? Okay. <laughs> and uh, go build yourself then, uh, your uh, shed. Thank you okay. so much. I appreciate your help tonight. Stay safe and uh, enjoy what summer we have here. You too, good night. Good night, thank you. Thank right. you. Bye bye. All right, Ryan. Moving on. Item 3.2 pre application review Weathersfield Villas, uh, 2176 to 2180 Berlin Turnpike, uh, HF3 Group, mixed use development. All right. So, as it says, it's pre application review. Uh, Mr. Foley, I assume you, the floor is yours if you would introduce yourself and perhaps your team if uh, I do see other names here. So, uh, and then, like the last person, 
Um, tell us what your story is. Okay, fantastic. Uh, it's great to meet everyone uh, electronically. This is really weird. <laughs> I really much, much rather prefer to meet you all uh, face to face, but under the circumstances, this will have to do. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Harold Foley. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a developer. Uh, I've built uh, uh, two developments in Connecticut uh, over the last, uh, I guess you would say, five years, five and a half years. Uh, we are about to start construction on our, and those two projects in Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh, the, they were historic rehabs. Uh, the third project that we're about to start is in East Lyme, uh, Connecticut. That's new construction. The historic rehabs are really a lot of headaches associated with them. Um, <laughs> and so, to say the least, to say the least. Um, You've got a historic but, district, perhaps you'd like to go try. We've <laughs> 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 got a chronic lodge that we could sell to you cheap. So. Uh, I think I'll pass. I think I'll pass. <laughs> but um, uh, this will be actually, and we are uh, scheduled, so we're going to close uh, that project in each line. Um, let me just first of all say, I mean, we really love my, my partners on the line, which is Quanji Swayze and our team, Vance Taylor, which is uh, the broker. Um, so we've been in Connecticut, like I said, since 2012, 13, didn't start construction until 2015, 14. Um, and we have a fourth project that we're going to start at the, towards the end of the year. Um, that's in Waterford, Connecticut. That's also new construction. And so we're looking at what will be, I guess you would say our fifth project. We're looking at the project in, in Weathersfield, which is at 2176 uh, Berlin Turnpike. Um, we, I really like uh, the, the site is undeveloped, is zoned for multifamily. <clears throat> I have my development team <laughs> on the line right here. Uh, in total, I've been doing um, um, what a fabulous team have done approximately 30 projects throughout the Southeast. Uh, and most recently, uh, Connecticut. So that would include Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, Tennessee, various towns in in in, in all of these places. Uh, we we were, he we were we were very active after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and built um, over 200 homes after the hurricane. Um, so in so like I said, the most recent set of developments have been in Connecticut. Uh, it's been great to work in Connecticut. The only thing I would have to say, the winters are pretty brutal. Uh, aside from that, it's a great place to work. <laughs> it's two developments. Um, so what we're proposing uh, with this particular project is anywhere from 50 to 60 units. Uh, it's now essentially just getting off the ground. The purpose of, of us having this uh, conversation or this, this initial meeting with, 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 you, with you fine folks is to gain some feedback in terms of um, the process, process it would take in terms of moving forward. Uh, so with that, I would like to um, uh, uh, introduce the, the other team members that we have. One is Quandra Swayze, if you want to wave. Um, and then we have Vance, who sort of wears multiple hats. He's a broker. He has obviously serves as a great um, uh, liaison, if you will, ambassador for many of our projects. He's very knowledgeable. I have Rob Capoletti. How can I forget Rob? Rob is right there located in, in, Merid in Meriden as well as East Groton. He's a fabulous guy to work with. He's very well known throughout the state. He also is a developer. So he'll be collaborating with us on this project. He's my partner. Um, I have, we also have uh, of Wallace Architects <clears throat> who has done several deals in I wanna say at least 14 or 15 states. And that's Mike Wallace. I don't know if Mike's on the line. Michael, you're on the line? Okay, if not, we have uh, also of, of Wallace Architects, we have Troy Rich. Troy Rich, I see he, he, that he's on. Uh, Troy, are you on? Okay, but he's the architect. He, he, he's showing up as being present. And we have um, two other members as well, Drew Pilato. Drew Pilato works along with Rob Capoletti and, um, and Anthony Urbano. Anthony's out of Orange, Connecticut. He's a, a construction manager. So uh, that's sort of introductory, if you will. We, we really are excited about the prospect of, of doing this development in Wethersfield. I guess it's Wethersfield slash Newington. 
because the property is bisected with the county line. So, uh, so we're just making an appropriate. That's Drew right there, uh, making a, making an appropriate outreach to the the powers that be. So, uh, like I said, I wish we would have had an opportunity to meet face to face, but under these circumstances, this will have to do so. Um, that that's an introduction of the team, and I guess I will turn it over to Vance or, or Quandre. Um, Carrying it forward. <clears throat> I can't hear you. Quandry can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Nope. Click the little bottom, the button to the bottom left, the bottom left of the screen. This is Quandry's first time with Zoom, by the way. <laughs> first time, period. Here we go. With, with Zoom. Most of the time it's with like uh, GoToMeet. What are you calling it? Yeah, just call it. Okay, Vance, did you wonder while Quandry is trying to connect, did you want to say anything um, to what's that? Sure. Uh, good evening. I'm, I'm Vance Taylor. Uh, my firm is Commercial Real Estate Group. Uh, we're based in Torrington. My uh, business partner is Jim Neckerman, who has an office in, in Berlin, who some of you may know. And uh, Jim uh, was able to introduce this particular parcel to us. Uh, owned by a variety of, of folks, uh, primarily with the last name Turgeon. They're all very supportive and, and eager and excited to see this development proceed. As, as Harold may have explained, uh, you know, we've, been, we've been in negotiations for a while and, and wanted to come before uh, your commission, certainly to discuss the concept plan that, that the architects had prepared, which uh, comprises five uh, buildings together with a uh, sort of a, a small community center uh, for a fitness center and business center, and then also a, a, uh, a commercial building too, so that uh, to, com to satisfy the, the mixed use requirements of the RC zone. Uh, so I, I think it, uh, primarily we were just interested in, in gaining some, some feedback to talk a little bit about the, the concept, to talk further about the kinds of special permit requirements that I know is required in section 510 of your regs. To, to take a look at that a little more closely to see what we need to be addressing uh, to, to make this development uh, suitable. And I think one of the other, and also just, just as a point of information, my, my colleague Jim is, is, has had conversations over the last few days with folks from the Salvation Army. Uh, historically, we've, we've discussed a, a means of second uh, access, emergency access to the parcel through the Salvation Army. I don't have anything specifically to report to you this evening about his progress, but but certainly uh, the initial conversation seemed quite, quite positive in trying to work something out with them to provide that emergency access. I, th I think the only other question really that, that I know, Harold, I wanted to raise was the fact that, and uh, Peter and I have discussed this as well, the, uh, since the, the town boundary transects this property and, and about six tenths of an acre in Newington and the majority of the acreage is in uh, Weathersfield, we, we also would like to know how we might be able to adapt the developments such that the non-residential piece could be located in Newington nearer to, uh, nearer to the frontage of, of the Berlin Turnpike rather than be on the Weathersfield side uh, further removed from the Turnpike, which obviously for a retail building would not be its best location. So that's, that's certainly something we'd like to chat about just to make sure that there's a way for your commission to accommodate the fact that even though it's a mixed use development, the, the mix might be also mixed between two towns. So with that said, as I say, the, the, the owners, just in case you want to know, the owners are very supportive of the development. They've all, we, we are under contract, so we do have a purchase and sale agreement. Harold therefore has control of the site at the moment. And uh, we, we're anxious to, to hear your comments and, and to hear the, to, to, to take a look at the, uh, the presentation that uh, Harold and his architects have prepared for you for this evening. So thank you. Oh, um, would it be um, desirable for everybody else on the commission to get a refresher from Peter? And I hope, uh, I'm sure he's prepared to do so about the history here, because it's not the first time that a mixed use proposal has come before us. Advance, I, I think I caught in your discussion that Maybe you were involved with some of the previous ones? No, okay. this, is, this is my first journey in. Okay. So, so with that, you know, I assume perhaps that Peter has already told you some of the hurdles that the other folks before you have come across. 
I actually don't know what they are. All I know is it didn't go forward um, on several occasions. So, Peter? I, I don't think there was any particular hurdle that was outstanding. It was just that the previous interested parties never came forward to the next step. I think we've had four pre-application meetings with different parties. Uh, we've even met with the entire uh, Turgeon family at different points in time um, to try and, um, you know, encourage some type of development there. So, um, yeah, there's no outstanding issue that, you know, I need to pass on to these folks uh, in terms of lessons learned. It's just that those projects never made it to the actual application stage um, at, at certain points. Um, some of the proposals were straight multifamily with no commercial components and that would have required a zone change and for whatever reason they decided not to not to pursue that so um, a couple of um, issues that uh, have already been discussed obviously you're going to have to we're gonna have to figure out a way to coordinate this with the town of Newington our neighbors um, in the past, I think they may have deferred to us, but if the commercial building is gonna be in Newington, it may be a, a different uh, process. Um, there is the issue of the second means of egress or access. So it was discussed about reaching out to the Salvation Army and seeing if um, something like that could be worked out. The Berlin Turnpike is also a state highway. So you're gonna have to deal with the Connecticut DOT in terms of um, you know the curb cuts and whether they require any, you know, turning lanes or acceleration lanes. There have been, there has been that conversation in the past. So somebody needs to put that on their agenda. Um, and then uh, there are wetlands on the property, obviously, and the proposed concept is pretty close to those wetlands. So we're gonna have to take a close look at uh, the boundary of the wetlands as it relates to the grading scheme and the drainage scheme. Um, there's a, a new emphasis on uh, low impact development stormwater uh, controls. So we can sort of talk about that offline since you're gonna be, we, we don't want any point discharges into the wetlands is really um, a short um, summary of, of that particular issue. So I think those are, um, those are the main things that I think from previous projects that you know, should, should be on somebody's agenda going forward. Uh, I'd like to interject here before I do, <clears throat> I just want to indicate that uh, I am president of the Orchard Brook Condominium Association. Uh, you're, we, our northern boundary is on the, the proposed development site. Uh, so it may come to a hearing, I may have to recuse myself. However, the last time there was a development, a proposal for a development, um, we were told that the only uh, possible uh, access was through our property, um, which was, was a problem. Uh, as an emergency access, but we did work out uh, an agreement with the prior developer, but it never went forward. The other thing is that we own um, half of the wetlands and you own half of the wetlands on our border. And because of the, this development would severely impact the, uh, we'll say the view of uh, units at the, at the end of our property, uh, we want to be sure that the drainage is such that those wetlands are completely protected. So at least we can protect what, wet, what uh, wetlands that we have. Uh, those wetlands are active uh, with deer, uh, with uh, coyotes. Uh, in, the, in our backyard, there's more wildlife than you'd see in, in many state parks. So I'm very concerned uh, about uh, the, it, you know, the interjection in, in dealing with those, those wetlands. I think it's something you should look at. Uh, but that's not to say that the association would be opposed to this uh, because we reached an agreement with a prior developer. But those are kinds of things that, we, that uh, uh, the association would be looking at. Yeah, I on, that point, on that point, I had a, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I yeah, just, I, um, in terms of the prior developer, uh, how many units were they proposing, Mr. Silver? Pardon? How many units were they proposing? The I don't know. It was so long ago. Uh, it had to be eight, nine years ago. I mean, I, I really do not uh, remember uh, the number of units that they had, uh, although they just indicated to us, and we had a meeting at the library, I remember, with the developer, 
And uh, they came forth and they just said, look, without your support, we can't go forward because uh, the only access is through the Orchard Brook, which is a private, which is a private road. Uh, and we were concerned about that because of use, you know, by others. As it is, stands right now, uh, employees of the Salvation Army, uh, uh, much to our concern, uh, walk through the wetlands to the bus stop on, um, on Prospect, that the only bus stops the Prospect. So we, they're continually walking through our, our property. We get to know these, there's only about three, of, uh, three folks and we've gotten to know them well and have no objection. Uh, but uh, if there was a large, um, uh, a, a large development there, uh, I can see people, many, many people uh, walking through. So I'd want to know about how our property would be protected uh, from encroachment by residents uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the development. George? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um... Why I, I get concerned as a former employee of the state housing department for 20 years and uh, I've dealt with a lot of this. And also I'm aware that uh, as far as affordable housing, I don't know what part of yours might be that. You don't know probably at this point. Uh, but we do have, and we make up 15, uh, I'd say 15% at least of our housing in Weathersfield is either uh, public or affordable. So it's not a requirement that we do more of that. So that's not the issue of the night though. I'm more concerned with apartments and even though you folks, I, I see the apartments looking very good in the uh, material we got. Uh, you do quality work, you have a quality team I'm kind of impressed with all of that. Um, my concern would be putting these apartments down in the main entrance being off of the uh, Berlin Turnpike and uh, having to go downhill. I consider it kind of you know, apartments down in a hole. I've always said that in the previous proposals. I hate using that term, but it is really down in there and difficult to get out of. And uh, it's ju not just the emergency need for another entrance. Uh, that's not the issue. It's just the main access road down in there. And I think it could be 10 to 20% grade and that, that would bother me. Um, anyway, um, I think that right now may be some of my, my concerns. Uh, you, you seem to have Peter gave a good review of, uh, and you did, uh, as far as what you want to do, but Peter gave a good overview of the issues of the past also. And, uh, and Mr. Silver, uh, I wasn't aware of his uh, condos being uh, on the, on the uh, joining side of this. He wasn't on our commission in previous proposals. When I've seen this two or three times, this location, it's just that it's down in there and it kind of bothers me. And uh, if you can answer me on that, I would be, that'd be a major issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I don't know if there's an answer to it. It is definitely in the hole. I guess conceptually, I, I, think I, I think I gather from your description, the building unit matrix, that each of these six building Six, well, I guess it's more, it's 12 units per building and it's, it's one on top of another, two stories, you know, uh, the two bedrooms, two stories on top of a, I'll call it a basement level uh, one bedroom, right? Is that kind of how it all works? So, so yeah, everything's, yeah, everything's correct. So we, we, I'm sorry, go ahead. We, we would essentially have the one one bedrooms um, at the lower level, and then you know obviously the two bedroom uh, townhome units above. Thank you. So, so pretty much everything looking west is on the high side, and the side facing the wetlands is coming out of the basement level. Thank you. 
I don't, I don't remember, you know, much of the details other than access in and out as Peter already described and having to deal with DOT, just from, you know, a traffic pattern perspective and being able to get into the site safely, et cetera. And to George's point, getting down the hill. Again, I don't know what that grade is, but I'm sure it's pretty steep. Where, where exactly is the line go through there about where the future community building is proposed? Straight north, south, what? What, what line are you talking about, George? The uh, t town line. Uh, town line. <laughs> uh, maybe Peter can help there. You want me to try and pull up, pull up the drawings on the screen? Would that yeah, be it's not shown on the sketch we got, so that's why. Let, that. let me try and do that. Hold on one second here. Sure. I'm going to try and do something technical again. Yeah. On, on live, on a live Zoom meeting. So hold, hold your breath here. <laughs> <laughs> we should all hang up now. You're not used to Zoom, Peter, by now. Here we go. We're getting warmer here. Let me see if I can find the drawings. Here we go. Yeah, it doesn't have the town line on it. No. Um, <sighs> yeah, no, no, the, the, it doesn't show it on here. Let me um, see. There's, there was another drawing in the set that might. Yeah, it might be a previous one here. Well, I don't have those in here, but I have. Um, oh. You know, I was hoping this would show it. I think um, the line runs basically along this property line here. So if you want to extend that just straight across here. So everything in this front of the L I think is, is pretty much in the, uh, in, in Newington. So that's, a, that's probably a rough. Yeah, a rough. in other words, from the community, future community building on up to the top, right? To the park. Pretty much, yeah, I think yeah. it's roughly in here somewhere. It might, it might Which go would beat all the commercial buildings, right? Yeah. Yep, pretty much. Okay. So we got all the apartments and units. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The thing is, what Peter was kind of implying before that that might actually mean that uh, Newington might have a different opinion this time around, and there's different chair people too. So uh, different opinion on how to apply the uh, the zoning regs from Newington. Have the applicants had discussions with the town planner in Newington? I can answer that. Yes, uh, actually, oh, probably about a year ago, we, we had begun some conversations with uh, with Peter, and we also had invited Craig Miner to, uh, to to join us in Peter's office. And then the, this development got kind of pushed back a little bit as other ones moved forward. So uh, we have, in fact, uh, I just reached out to uh, to Craig again, and of course, his his sense is it's not like he has much of a horse in this race per se. Although uh, he did say that we would certainly need to come to him for site plan approval as well. Uh, and, and obviously uh, issues of access. I know I've uh, already had some conversations last year, I think it was with DOT with the regional district, since I guess that's where the issues of curb cuts and things would take place. I do know though, because we're under 100 uh, units here proposed that we would not need any type of ASTA permitting. So, so yes, to answer your question, uh, even though there's only 0.6 acres of this total uh, parcel in the town of Newington, certainly we, we want to make sure that they're well involved in the discussions too. Peter, is there, um, what is the density that's allowed? Are, is that an issue in this? Um, the density for the, this site is much larger than it appears on the, on the layout, uh, you know, the, there's a high and dry L portion of the property, but it also extends farther into the wetlands that um, Dan had mentioned. So um, at this point, it doesn't come anywhere near uh, maximizing the density. You, in this, in a mixed use scenario, I think you can get as high as 25 units an acre. So this is nowhere near that, that type of density. Now that you say that, I guess I remember, wasn't one of the proposals a uh a single unit higher higher rise building yeah it was one large building um even being one large building i think they only maybe had 80 odd units proposed and this is i think 60 50 to 60 in that range so yeah ac actually peter that other proposal uh, the one big building called for 104 units okay getting my there was as i say there were three or four projects so i'm getting yeah. a little mixed up but 
And that was one of our objectives. We didn't want to go in and just overwhelm that particular site and maximize the number of units. I mean, that's just, one is kind of not our style and it just doesn't appear to be consistent with the surrounding area. So we, we didn't want to, we didn't feel as though that site could, and the location could accommodate or would be appropriate, I should say. So that's why we, we backed it down to a number that we thought was uh, more consistent with the existing densities in the area. And um, we didn't want to necessarily, just, like I said, just overwhelm the site with that many units. So we wanted to strike, but at the same time, we, we have to be able to do a deal that's financially uh, feasible as well. So it, it, it's sort of a balance between you know, what's reasonable and practical versus financial viability. I think with that 50 to 60 unit range, that was, we felt was a, was, was, a, was a healthy balance. How many, how many acres are high and dry here? Uh, unless Vance, you can answer or Carol. Yeah, it's, it's, it's roughly, uh, it's, it's about three, it's a little over three acres out of, out of the 10 or 11. So, so the majority is wet and, and this development obviously provides for maximizing the use of the, uh, the three acres and, and leaving the rest uh, undisturbed. I, I did point, I, I'm looking here also at an aerial map that someone provided me. I think it was, um, who was it, uh, Jim, um, what's his name? Jim Cassidy, who did some of the original work, the engineering firm of Hallisey, Pearson and Cassidy. And they, they provided one and I'm looking here at a map that shows the site. And basically to answer an earlier question, the, uh, the Newington piece of it, it, it's kind of got this little tiny jog like an L like a fat L with a tiny uh, extension that goes up to the turnpike. The little extension really is primarily in the, the line pretty much transects, transects right there. And it makes the, the rest of the parcel pretty much like a, a somewhat modified rectangle. Uh, but the little, the little piece is the only piece really that's in, um, that's in Newington. So, so access, basically access from this parcel is through Newington. Clearly. The way to describe it. Absolutely right. <clears throat> and I did hear while, while I was, uh, while, while some of you folks were talking, I did uh, get a quick call from my, my partner, Jim Neckerman, who tells me that, uh, that he's had some, again, just to, to emphasize the point, he had some uh, initial conversations with the Salvation Army as far as emergency access means. It's, they, they, the conversations went well. He's been referred to someone else who's now, I guess, handles these kinds of matters within the Salvation Army. But so far, you know, it seems to be positive, but it's, it's interesting to too, Sue, too to see if we may be able to uh, gain some sort of understanding or, or accommodation from uh, from the neighboring residential development as well. I have a question. I did uh, have the uh, fire marshal take a quick peek. Uh, he liked the circulation pattern. If you look at the way the parking and the road network is, is laid out, it loops. Uh, around the low side and the high side. Um, so um, he, he wants to take a further look at the turning radiuses for their fire vehicles. So he's um, um, happy to do that, but just wants some of those that look a little bit tighter than others to be somebody to put a radius on them to make sure their trucks can get around once they get into the site. Um, he was not so concerned about having the second means of e access and egress given the number of units. Uh, he, he was indicating to me that he believes that as apartments, the buildings are, are gonna have to be sprinklered, I think. So um, that, that gives him, that le lessens his concern to a certain extent. It would be nice to have the second, but it may not be mandatory. So we can have a, a further conversation with the fire marshal about that. Joe, Ryan, Tony. Uh, um, Peter, a, Peter, this is David. Is that a quick question? I know we've discussed this before in um, the previous projects. Is there any issue with the uh, population of uh, students that we're going to acquire for our school system? Um, units. When we, if you remember, when we um, permitted the uh, 75 Ridge Road project, we required a pretty detailed uh, impact assessment. Um, the numbers of children out of, I can't remember if that was 65 units, 64 units, were projected to be in the single digits. 
when I last talked to the developers, there were no school age children in that project. Uh, I think that is a typical experience with, uh, with apartments. Um, so uh, obviously we'll, we'll look at that, but um, I, I'm not concerned that it's going to uh, impact the schools and the school system in any way. And the school system is going through their own assessment. So we can sort of plug into that, but I, I, it's not, it's not a concern uh, okay. that I would uh, have. Okay. Rich, you seem to have taken off your mic. Yeah, the, the lawnmower stopped working, so I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess a, a few things. I remember, uh, you know, I remember the, the previous applications or pre-applications on this property, and, and I think there, there even was a zone change uh, text amendment that, that accommodated this by, by dealing with um, projects that cross the town line. A um, couple of the things that I remember being of interest to me on the prior application was that, um, you know, I, I was frankly hoping that the project would be something more than just lip service toward a mixed use development. Um, you know, this one, the the box of the building is slightly larger than the box of the building last time. Um, but I, I, I don't think the, uh, the regulations define mixed use, but um, you know, if something is 90% residential and 10% commercial and the entire commercial use is in Newington, I, I, I don't know what that gets us in terms of mixed use development that we were trying to encourage. Um, other people have listed several of the, the issues that I do remember we discussed the last time, you know, including how fire trucks from Weathersfield would get to the site, how school buses from Weathersfield would get to the site, um, that school buses from Weathersfield wouldn't be going down a private driveway to pick up kids, uh, having people, you know, potential small children waiting on the side of the Berlin Turnpike for the bus to pick them up was not, you know, situation that anybody was really thrilled about changed over time or not but it, it might be worth looking back to see what the you know what the discussions were on the prior applications just so that you don't end up having to uh, you know reinvent the wheel on those um, one question I had about the about the, the developer is what what is where where's your project in East Lyme and and how big is it um, yeah, the, am I on mute? Oh, yeah. the, the project in East Lyme, which is a fabulous project, by the way, it's uh 56 townhomes and it's on, uh, uh, it's at 275, the actual address is 277R for residential because there's, um, another commercial, um, there's a business at 277, but it's directly across the street from the Rocky Neck State Park. And it's 56, like I mentioned, 56 townhomes. And we're about to start construction there the first or second week in, in um, July. And we have a contractor out of Meriden, La Rosa Building Group. That's the contractor in concert with uh, Maynard Road uh, to commence the, the, the construction. Is that the one that had, used to have the bridal mall in it and it has the sea spray condos at the top? Uh, this property is vacant land right now. So, um, the prop, the, the, the site has been undeveloped. So it's, uh, 24 okay. acres, 23 and a half acres in total, but the 17 of those acres, 17 of those 23 acres are all, uh, wetlands conservation area. So we're going to be building on seven, of them, seven acres. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the, the uh, Harold, just to jump in a little bit on that, this is Vance again. The, uh, the actual address is Capitol Drive in East Lyme, and Capitol Drive is, is one, one street removed from um, Four Mile River Road and, and the full interchange of I-95 at that point. Yep, okay. Mm -hmm. Just to re reiterate, uh, 
principal concern, I think, of the our association would be how you're going to handle and preventing uh, kids uh, coming walking through our property to get to Prospect Street uh, because the that's where the bus is. So mm -hmm. if you have a, a kid who doesn't go to a Wethersfield High School but goes to a technical school or whatever, yeah. uh, they would have to so where are they going to walk through to get to get a bus and uh, uh, how are you going to be sure that uh, our private drive is protected from encroachment? I think that's a huge thing as well as the wetlands. Okay. Um, we have not um, looked into that. Uh, you're raising this for the first time uh, on this call, so we didn't consider that. But this is something that we're obviously the team is going to note and see if we can come up with a plan in terms of addressing that particular concern. And I appreciate you raising that, by the way. We were not aware of, of, of that being an issue. <clears throat> One last question, if I may, is um, have, have any or all of your projects in Connecticut been 830G? Um, uh, look, uh, the property in East Lime, let me just give you a little bit of, of a background there. That project, uh, we are buying, we are purchasing the, the land from uh, an owner who took that project through maybe a five or six year 830G uh, process. Um, when Vance had identified that property, it was already approved. They had gone through the courts. Um, so we were not a party uh, to that. The property had already been rezoned through 830G. So I personally have not, we have not been involved directly in the process, but the owner from which we are buying the property has. Okay. So I have not been, a, I have not been through that process. <clears throat> I think let me just jump back in on that for a moment for that question too. I, I think one of the things that, and I've been working with, with Harold Foley now for probably about five or six years, one of the things that we certainly have not done in any of the sites we've identified, and, and as I've done my site searching and recommendations to Harold, I've been very sensitive to this too. Uh, Harold's posture is one of never wanting to get into that kind of confrontational situation which is forcing an 830G situation. I mean, I, I think that's in part why um, early on, certainly as we're doing now, to approach local officials to make sure that there's general welcomeness and receptivity to what he's doing so that it's, it's not going to be something that, that's forced upon any community. And, and clearly uh, in Waterbury at the time when, when, the, when regulations were a little different and, and he, the, the developments were encouraged to be more in urban areas now, CHFA has, has changed that whole philosophy to where now they want to see more developments in, in more suburban areas like Wethersfield or Newington or like East Lyme or like Waterford. And also candidly communities that have yet to achieve a 10% uh, affordable housing stock threshold. And I know there was mentioned earlier in the meeting about um, the number in, in, in Wethersfield being uh, maybe close to 15%, according to the Department of Housing stats. What do they, what do they say it is now? 9.44. Um, 9.44, oh, really? yeah, that's right. They're wrong. I always argued with them when I was in there over this, and I'm a planner with the state at that point, but they, they wouldn't recognize, Peter, our public housing units, which are owned by the town rather than the state. <clears throat> But I, I will say that in one other situation, the town really was, was not terribly uh, comfortable with the development and, and basically Harold chose not to proceed. So it's not like uh, there would be a, a willingness on his part, uh, at least I, ha I hope I'm speaking correctly for you, Harold, yeah. in, in, exercising, in exercising 830G. I think we'd rather go in communities where, where the development would be encouraged and welcomed. And, yeah. and, and let me say- I mean, and, and, and I don't, I don't mean to imply that I have any predisposition against Rich, Rich, so Rich, you're freezing up, right? I mean, um, I mean, we've had a lot of 830Gs that have been welcomed by towns. Um, you know, you just you just want to do it right, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Well, you know, I've I've been through enough of these developments and have worked with 
like I said, I've done nearly 30 developments in a multitude of cities. Um, Quan has been right there with me for nearly every one. And um, so, I mean, we try to be as cooperative as possible. I think I've learned through nearly 20 years of development. It's good to have these conversations on the front end and I can appreciate George raising the issues and Rich raising the issues in a manner that they have. Um, because, you know, this business is a cross of, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's just as much of an art as it is a science. So there's the technical exactly. aspects related to a project and then there are the, I don't know, the artistic side of the project that is community outreach and working with the town officials to uh, move a development that is hopefully consistent with what the what the expectations are of of uh, com communities in which we're going to be developing. So, uh, as Vance mentioned, we elect not to take approach where we want to become contentious. But as it as it relates to your issue, and I mean, again, I don't want to go too far off on this tangent, but George raised the issue in terms of affordability. Fortunately, the IRS has adjusted its definition or I should say expanded its definition of what affordability is. And I've done some research um, for Wethersfield and the area median income in, um, in Wethersfield is uh, $97,000. And as a result, affordability as, de as deemed by the IRS is up to 80% of that. So you're looking at folks that are making $82,000. That's a pretty broad band swathe of, of individuals and families with whom could live in these, these developments, particularly as you, as you mentioned in the context of, of COVID. So, you know, so it really expands to a, a very broad uh, cross section of, of workers uh, in, in, these, uh, in these communities. So, um, so there's affordability, but like I said, $82,000 is a pretty uh, uh, expanded definition as a race to affordability is concerned. But again, I don't want to, I just wanted to address that since that was raised. I know that's not the, 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 the objective of this particular meeting, but since it was raised, I prefer to get a, a, out ahead of it because those questions are gonna come up inevitably. You know? so, so I just right. wanted to address that at this particular point in time. Uh, Harold, did you, did you state earlier what the mix, uh, what percentage of units you thought might be low or moderate? Have you gotten I, that? We have not determined that as of yet, but I can say at a minimum, we're going to have 20% um, um, market rate units at a minimum. From a, uh, from a technical perspective, anybody else have any uh, additional comments or thoughts to offer that they should be thinking about? One thing I'd like to, if, if I may advance, one thing I'd like to ask, um, oh yeah, I don't have to t say who I am, you can see me. Um, too many <laughs> conference calls, I guess, in my life. But um, the, the, the one question, could, could, could you, Peter, or maybe some of the commission members speak to, and I know the architects are listening, as is Harold and, and, and Quandre, can you speak a little bit about what kinds of things, should this development proceed, what kinds of things you would look for to grant the special um, the special permit, what what types of I, I've read the list of characteristics in 5.10. Uh, are there any in particular there that that maybe you or the commission members could address as it pertains specifically to the proposal now before you? I think you heard a couple of the concerns about impacts to community services, the schools. I mean that should be uh, a conversation that you have um, um, pretty quickly with. Um, logistics in terms of if, if there are kids living here, how, how they're going to be picked up. I think that's kind of a, uh, an important topic. Um, I'm not so much concerned about the impact to the schools, but nevertheless, when you do reach out to the school system, you should get a sense of where they are uh, with the school age population and a, a quick projection of how many kids you think are going to be added just to make sure that issue isn't going to jump out uh, at some point. Um, this is a, obviously a state highway. Um, there probably should be some level of traffic statement. I don't know if it's a full-blown study. I mean, it's a, it's a divided highway so that we know what the traffic flow is going to be and we know what intersections are going to be impacted by it. But nevertheless, uh, it is a state road, so you should pay attention to that. Uh, I think the wetlands have been uh, previously flagged. Uh, so if, if that's 
been too long. Someone's probably going to need to get out in the field and, and document the location. I think the, the grading of the site and the stormwater management that we talked about is a, is a, an issue that um, has um, become more and more important recently. So um, those are the big ones that, that jump out. We do have a design review process. So the materials and the architecture, the buildings will have to go through that process, which is a separate process to the Planning and Zoning Commission, typically done um, before you get to the final detailed drawings for the Planning and Zoning Commission's approval. I'll add something uh, to that commentary. Um, I think the uh, access through the Salvation Army for emergencies is okay, but I drive all of these sites. I look at them before we talk about them. Uh, as I have this one again for the 10th time maybe in my career on the commission. Uh, but seriously, the access in through the Salvation Army lot and the quality of the paving is not that good. And I would want you guys to evaluate that in any proposal or be able to answer that situation. And, and that the gate and everything else and so forth, the emergencies and how it's handled. Because I think it's more important on this site the emergency than it would be on a in any other site because of the hill going down into it. So and would the it commercial be aspects on the on the on the Berlin Turnpike? Well, and certainly then from what from what uh, Mr. Silver said, it would seem that maybe we should also see if we could explore um, something in the way of a relationship with the abutting property there too, right? Well, that's fine. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, you know, what to do, but uh, I would be interested in what the fire marshal has to say. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, uh, Mr. Donati was fire marshal the last time this uh, this project uh, was on the board. It's out long ago, but uh, I have no idea his position uh, on the use of the Salvation Army uh, as uh, emergency access. I don't know. And I just, I, I just don't know. One other question, and, and, and Peter, I think we've discussed it a little bit, of just sort of backing up from um, a desire to, to submit necessary documentation to CHFA, say by the end of October, typically, um, in, in order for us to work our way through the process, assuming we had everything pretty well set, you know, could you give us sort of an idea and an indication on, on what would be a realistic timeline? Is it three months? Is it more? Is it less? Could, could you help me there? So you, you'll be dealing with um, most likely three of the boards and commissions, the uh, Inland Wetlands Commission, the Design Review, and then the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, the Wetland Commission will probably take about a month. Planning and Zoning is depending upon whether there's more than one hearing, that's about three weeks. And you could probably do the design review kind of in between those two. And that is part of planning and zoning. The special permit uh, process runs concurrently with that, right? Yeah, it's actually part of the, it's a special permit with a site plan. So it's the same, one in the same. Okay. And there's overlap on those timeframes that I mentioned. So if you hit the meetings right, so we can talk offline about a schedule and some deadlines. And then if you can hit those deadlines, I, I think it's uh, well. I think I think a lot of it's going to be on your end getting the plans, you know, up to snuff in terms of being able to meet the site plan requirements. I guess too, just conceptually. I mean, from from what everyone's heard tonight, and and certainly there were some valid concerns raised. Is is this overall uh, concept something with, again addressing the points that need to be addressed? But is this something that, in general, people feel is 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 worth pursuing? Is, are, are you okay with it? I guess is the, way, is the question here. How does the town? How how do you how do you and your commissioners feel in general about what what they've heard this evening? What you've heard. So if uh, the rest of you will allow me, I'll start, <clears throat> um, and then you can kind of critique how I present it. Okay, um, we we've seen this before. 
uh, we were generally okay with it before. It just got down to the level of details that we never really got to, honestly, right? But from a general standpoint, uh, it's a parcel that has long been sitting here, and I think we want it developed. I think largely you will hear from people that we want to develop, and, and um, I think it's understood by most of us that there aren't too many options except this type of a development. So I, I think that's on the positive side, but there are just things that need to be worked out, right? And and, and some of those may take time, that's all. Did, did I understand your your point a minute ago that when October comes around, you need all your ducks in a row in order to apply for money? Is that how it works? Yeah, tip, uh, Harold can speak maybe more to this than I, but typically, um, we like to have everything pretty well in a go mode, particularly knowing that the zoning will accommodate the use. And here, if we need to get the special permit, that, that it's not just zoning as a matter of right, but rather with, with this permit, then we need to have that kind of those kinds of approvals in place in order to submit the application to CHFA, typically by the end of October or the beginning of November. The date varies a little bit, but in that timeline, if we miss that, then it's another year before we can apply. Right. That's correct. Yeah. That, that's correct. a little tight, four months to design it to it. the level of a... We could do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's only money, right? We could do it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, based on the detail that we've received already with a half a dozen or up to 20 or 30 projects, and Dr. Harold Foley seems to have a lot of credibility here. Um, and then the follow up, the team that he has around him. I don't. I don't remember us having a preliminary review like this, or a, at least a pre-application review as thorough and complete as that we've had it already. It's yeah. a difficult site. We've talked about this before, and uh, I, I can't uh, because of the difficulties on this site, and the they are not pushing the density to the max. Um, I think due diligence is on its way. Mm -hmm. What do you think, point. Tony? The uh, assessment will be on this. <laughs> well, I already had that oh, for you. Look at that. <laughs> that'll be at the next. That'll be at the next meeting, George. Can we do, can we have a tax abatement? What about a tax abatement? <laughs> oh my God! Notice we all pause when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I think an answer to your question. I think that we, as a commission, uh, are very look forward to development in town as long as it's properly planned. I understand. Yeah. I want to jump back in for a moment, though, just just on one point, uh, and and I don't think that it was an F, an attempt to, to to give lip service or a token gesture to the non-residential piece. It's just as a practical matter, uh, given the site, given the fact that there is about a you know a twenty foot drop from Berlin Turnpike down to the site, roughly uh, down to the majority of the site. Obviously, it, it it doesn't lend itself particularly well to anything other than residential in the rear. Therefore, begging the the non-residential piece really to be in that little dog leg, uh, which just so happens to be pretty much exclusively in, in the town of Newington. So I guess uh, the one thing I'd, I'd like just some some indication of is, is and I think it was mentioned earlier about a, a text amendment for projects crossing town lines, whether or not we could have some indication of, of your receptivity would, to, to a mixed use development where the other mixed pieces is, is in the little dog leg, just because of the practical nature of wanting a, the non-residential piece to be a, a, as close to the turnpike uh, frontage as possible. I'll just react and say, I think I recognize that, you know, as a site constraint, uh, you know, so it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, like if if the, the prior applications have all been similar and they just kind of fell through, it, it's like, I don't really see another possible viable use for this area other than what's being proposed and commissioner mickey with his point of how we're not really maxing out the 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 useful <clears throat> like the, every square inch of the of the property like we're we're putting an appropriate amount of units um I, you know i i think it makes sense and i i really don't think that there's like going to be an application that's going to be better than this in terms of like the use of it, like mixed use, I, I, I guess I would, uh, you know, it, it makes sense to put the, to put the non-residential part up front. Um, 
and you know i just i worry a little bit about the the in and out like the traffic of it because you you are right on the berlin turnpike so you know you're you're putting in signs you're you're worried a little bit about the the visibility of the driveway that kind of thing so just from like a, a motorist like you're going to get more um traffic due to the non-residential side of the of the property like you're going to have people coming in and out so it's just another curb cut that people have to worry about as they're speeding along um but honestly i don't i don't see a i don't see another viable option that would be uh, any different than this application for this area so i think a lot of it also depends on what the commercial use is i mean if it's a taco bell drive the rich Rich, I can help. Rich, from having, you know, two retail units. So, Rich, Rich, you're freaking us out. Yeah, that again. You have you have bad Wi-Fi out there. You're stre you're stretching the limits of your Wi-Fi capabilities. <laughs> I did like the Taco Bell comment though. Yeah, that that came through. <laughs> Taco Tuesday. <laughs> My ears perked up when he said tacos. <laughs> I think so. Rich just nod if uh, the gist of it was it's the right commercial use, right? That, that's of interest to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, a, a drive through restaurant is different from, you know, a, a phone store and a flower store or something like that. But to give you an example, something that uh, yeah, I was very happy with the mixed use was at the Borden. I mean, that uh, worked out very nicely before the commission. So, so I'm going to suggest that uh, Vance, uh, I want you to take a test with Peter. Peter's going to give you a test on what everybody does for a day job that you've heard here today, because I listen to all the comments and it's, it's obvious to me what they all do. But uh, I guess I wonder what it is to somebody who has, doesn't know the group. <laughs> Peter, you can apply that test. I'll, I'll, uh, I won't do it today, but I'll, uh, I'll do yeah, it yeah, yeah. next time we talk. <laughs> Are there other questions? Uh, questions or comments for the for the applicant as they uh, proceed on with this. What? Excuse me. This is Dave Edwards again. Um, one thing I noticed: the population of parking places, eighty-seven to sixty units. Is that mathematically correct? I mean, I'm just I'm just thinking if every do double unit needs two parking places in one, you're at ninety. But one bedroom apartments are going to so double up with parking. Also, I'm just looking at it from a standpoint that the site may have to um, hit on more parking than shown. So our, our okay. ratio is one and a half per unit. Okay. Just so you know. Okay. Separate from the commercial. Okay. Not, not immediately seeing anybody else with additional questions or comments. We wrap this up. I'm still trying to figure out which one of you is the undertaker, which one's the actuary, and, and <laughs> which, which, which one's the DJ. <laughs> none, none of the above. So. Oh, that's good. Uh, <laughs> know, Maybe it's just obvious to me. It'll be, you know, I'm always interested it in listening to everybody's lawyer. comments, you know. But, but yeah, none of those. <laughs> Your turn, Harold. No, no comment. I'm good. <laughs> I'm just hungry right now. I just mentioned Taco Bell. Taco Bell. I could, so I'm hungry right now. All right. All right. And we'll wrap it. And uh, the best of luck. And I suspect we'll see you again. Absolutely. Hey, I'm really looking forward to meeting you guys. I'm hoping to get up there late June, early July. I don't know how everything is going to go with the COVID, but I would rather have met everyone, you know, personally. But yeah, I'll have to eventually. We would too. Thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. I really Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Care. Did care. your voice come through? Your voice came through finally. Oh, finally. Yeah, we heard her. <laughs> Rob, I miss you. I miss seeing you, Rob. My voice wasn't working before. All right. Um, we'll, move, we'll move on to the next item. Take care, folks. Bye-bye. See you all later. All right. So the next item, Ryan.
Yes, uh, item 3.3, CGS uh, section 824 review, Elm Street extension, Weathersfield Game Club, easement and hold, hold harmless agreement. I'm gonna hand this one off to, uh, I see Jack Bradley out there. Jack, can you can you hear me and you're, you're fine handling this one? And you're on mute. Just gotta unmute you. Jack, you waited an hour and 15 minutes. You're on mute. You're on mute. Jack, if you, Jack. If you look to the lower left, lower left on the screen. Need a sign to hold up. I'm trying to find it. There we go. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're good. Good morning, everybody. Yes. Uh, there you go. Uh, that was uh I thought you lawyers all operated on Zoom. Yeah, well, I got the, I got channel 16 going the laptop and the uh iPhone. So <laughs> going to work, I hope. Um <laughs> This is um an A24 review um uh, involves uh uh uh, Elm Street, what's called Elm Street Extension. It's an old road, it's a road, a dirt road in the meadows along the Connecticut River. And there were two incidents, uh, at least two, one in 1996 and another one in 2001 that caused the, um, the embankment of the Connecticut River to be, to wash out. So many of you know um, Mike Turner uh, back in back in about 2001, um, uh, there was discussion with DEEP and others about what 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 they should do about it, and uh, they relocated a 200 foot, approximately 200 foot portion of the of the old dirt roadway, approximately 20 feet westerly, away from the bank of the river, onto um, land which at the time was owned by the Keisha family. Um, and they, um, they had plans to have that be a temporary, a temporary situation, but it has uh, pretty much become a permanent situation. Um, there was an agreement to pay uh, the Keisha family a hundred dollars a year for the right to use uh, the relocated uh, to, for the right to relocate the road onto their property. Anyway, in 2018, uh, which was at the same time as the town bought the Keisha farm, uh, Keisha sold a, uh, several lots in the meadows to the Weathersfield Game Club, and they've been very cooperative. Uh, with the town, um, but they had a concern about, um, uh, really a concern about liability. Um, they were okay with the fact that the road had been moved further onto their land, but they had a, had a concern of safety and liability because as we know, there have been a number of incidents down there um, involving, you know, accidents and stuff. They were concerned about their liability if there was an accident. So, they approached the town and requested um, a hold harmless agreement. And that evolved into um, an access agreement, which memorializes uh, the fact that the, that the road is a public road, even though it's located on their land. And so they're giving us an access agreement, which um, um, doesn't change the road in any way, but it recognizes and memorializes what what has happened. And I think it's a a sensible um, solution. And uh, like I say, the, the game club's been very cooperative. They're not insisting on any payment from the town. Um, but uh, if there's any other questions, I'll be happy to try to, to answer it. But as many of you know, under 8-24, there's a there's a planning and zoning re, uh, requirement to furnish a report as to whether this is uh, consonant with you know your plans, your plan of development, and other things. Uh, uh, so we're asking, uh, or the parties are asking, um, 
for a favorable report on this, and then it'll go to the town council for approval of the uh, easement. Um, I think that's it in a nutshell. Questions? Come on, Lisa. I'm, I'm, I'm generally aware of the situation and I, I certainly don't have any specific concerns when I heard about it. Others? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy with this, that the town is going ahead with it. It makes sense to me after a number of years of, uh, I've heard about this before, vaguely back a few years ago, and uh, I'm glad it's coming to this kind of a consummation. I hope we legally don't require that if a flood ever comes through there and wipes out the uh, uh, along the river that uh, and takes out part of the road that we have to reconstruct it at a high cost. But other than that, which is probably not going to happen, I hope, uh, because we're taking a making a prudent move here to keep it away from the river uh, and to uh, establish uh, the legal requirements for it. And I just hope that the lawyers on the commission will make comment further than me as to if this is the right way to go about it. I think it is, it appears good to me. Thanks. Except for the con potential construction that ever gets washed out along there, but I don't think it will, I hope not. And I think that's probably my, my only comment or, or concern is that it, is it far enough away is it going to have to be moved again um you know but i i can't tell from the map of as far as for the floodplain um is it is it far enough it's really my worry i guess well you know if if you if you're familiar with that area the road has been there for uh, probably a couple of hundred years it's always been a dirt road and it's simply um, uh, you know it's it's it just had to be moved because it, it, it was unstable and the the alternative and it's it was done it's already it's something that already happened it was done you know 20 years ago uh, almost and um, this just recognizes that it is a town road and uh, we, don't, we don't have any increased duty to maintain it. It's the ordinary duty that we have to maintain all town roads. And I don't think there's any plans to pave the road, um, but uh, it does require some maintenance um, from time to time. Um, and I know in Rocky Hill, I'm not exactly sure in Wethersfield, but Rocky Hill receives certain grant monies from the state to maintain their portion of the Meadows Road. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if the town doesn't receive some amount of money to assist in the maintenance, but um, uh, it's just a matter of nature, whether it's, whether it's far enough. It's certainly, uh, it has worked all right for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, anyway, Thank you. This just recognizes, it recognizes <laughs> that it's a town road and it, and it, and it and it clarifies that we have the right to have the road on their property. It was on their property before, but essentially we didn't really have the, any formal right to move the road. And that's what this, this sort of ratifies what we've already done. Mitch? No, I, I think this is a, this is a good thing. Um, you know, the river does what the river wants to do. There may be a point in time where, you know, this is washed out and, you know, if there's enough, you know, enough change down there, the town may have to reassess whether it's even going to keep roads open there. I mean, it, they're, the property owners down there know how to get around better than the average public does. And, you know, even if the town were to say we're done maintaining this road, all of the property owners would have private rights to continue to travel, um, you know, on the former road to get to where they need to be. Um, I know that different parts of the road have been closed at different times so that, uh, you know, only the people who really need to be there can be there. And, uh, 
you know, it, it may come to that. But I guess um, for purposes of what we're what we're dealing with right now, this is, you know, this is a good thing and it, and it's appropriate. And I would make a motion that we uh, give a positive referral under A24 for this access easement. Second. I second. Um, Joe, Joe, uh, you know, I assume you don't really have any concerns either. No, I was unmiking. I was going to second it if it didn't have a second. <laughs> All right. So we have a, a positive I have a, quick, I, have a, I have a quick question, Jack. Um, looking at the site plan, we have four parcels, I think, that the game club has. Is this arrangement or this agreement uh, valid for the northerly, northerly uh, fifth and parcel in south, south of this parcel, of these four parcels? Is there other agreements in place? And... Is this a precedent setting uh, arrangement where we can approach the other other property owners? No, this this just just applies to the game club property uh, to those uh, parcels shown on the uh, on the map, and I, I'm sure that there is no there's no agreement. You know, like I said, Tony, this road is a couple of hundred years old. There's unlikely that there's any agreements um, with. Um, the property owners. Most of the deeds for the game club describe those lots as being bounded on the east by the Connecticut River. So the property runs uh, mm -hmm. to the Connecticut River and it's just that where the road was before, uh, a portion of it is no longer there. So their property still is bounded on the Connecticut River, but the road is in a slightly different uh, place than it was. Well, like George, every so often I try to uh, visit the site and I drove down there a couple of weeks ago and there is a gate. I, I don't know if it goes all the way down to the Rocky Hill line or not, but um, there's yeah. quite a bit, quite a few other property owners that might, might want to consider this type of arrangement, I would think, for liability purposes. So, um, well, I think, I think I it's think, a, good, a good effort. I, yeah, the gates, that's a whole other subject that... <laughs> Many of you know in Rocky Hill, that was quite a story in Rocky Hill. Yes, okay. yeah. But it, it's really the ordinary duty that we have to maintain a road uh, right now. The town has a duty to maintain a road. And if the highway is deemed to be defective and somebody's injured because of a defective highway, there's potential liability on the uh, town. But that's not a increased liability. It's our usual and standard liability that we already have. Sure. It's a great effort and I support the, uh, the motion. Same here. I feel well, one, I'm glad that O'Keefe and Evans have gotten together to do this too. That's great. Yes, Mr. Paul O'Keefe was very, uh, uh, very helpful. He's the president of the game club. He was a, uh, he was a uh, very uh, helpful. I mean, they they wanted it. They 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 wanted it, and uh, I think it's a good you know solution for everybody. I thought Paul was long lost to Glastonbury, but apparently he's still active here. I didn't know he was this. Yeah, he's active on this issue, yeah. That's <laughs> for sure. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Excellent. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jack. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. All right, um, Ryan? Oh, item three, four, solar PV, which I guess is Peter. I got, uh, I got kicked out of the meeting for a little while there. I, I'm sure you all missed me. I'm back. Did you get, did you get back. kicked out? Didn't even notice, so. Peter Boom. <laughs> yeah. Peter Boom. Right. We, we didn't even notice. Right, thank you, appreciate it. So um, <laughs> we've, we've discussed this subject uh, in the past um, the reason it's on your agenda tonight is we are uh, a little bit later on. I'll give you an update. We are uh, gearing up for the uh, submission for the sustainable CT uh, certification program. Uh, one of the um, areas that we can get um, some points towards that certification deals with how we handle uh, solar uh, volta photovoltaic applications through the building department, through our regulations, um, through um, permit processing and things like that. So one of the um, areas within the certification is to assess uh, your zoning regulations as to how they accommodate um, solar 
uh, applications. So this memo dated June 11th uh, is a summary. We've talked about this in the past and we identified a few areas that could be uh, fine tuned uh, to make that process a little clearer uh, and a little more, uh, a little more understandable for applicants. Um, so um, just to quickly go through this, give you a quick summary. There's some recommendations at the end. We can take this up at another uh, point in time, but I wanted to at least give you kind of an overview. Um, in terms of activity, uh, for the longest time, uh, it was typical that we would have one application a year. If you look at the table there, um, that, that recently has changed with some incentives that are going on at the state level uh, and uh, increased tech technological advances. So um, in 2011, we had one application. Uh, in 2015, that bumped up to 146. And we've stayed pretty steady around 60, 70, 80. Uh, so in 2019, we had 63 three applications. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a permanent area that keeps the building department um, pretty, pretty busy. So I think it kind of identifies maybe the need to pay a little more attention to these things than maybe we've had in the past. Um, page two uh, identifies uh, the various sections of your regulations. The one point that uh, I wanted to make is that we do not have definitions anywhere in the regulations as to um, how to, how to regulate. There, there are different kinds of solar installations and we make no distinction uh, whatsoever. So that's an area that maybe we could uh, fine tune uh, a little bit. Um, primarily your regulations deal with how we accommodate uh, these kind of installations in residential zones. Um, and we have a bunch of standards uh, for that, um, primarily for roof mounted installations. We make no mention of um, how we would handle uh, a ground mounted installation. Uh, down where I live, um, you see these enormous ground mounted solar installations in yards. For example, a lot of our lots are way smaller, so it doesn't make a lot of sense, but nevertheless, it's an area that we probably should uh, refine uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, page three uh, talks about some of the other zones, uh, the conservation zones, the business zones. Um, uh, and once again, uh, our regulations are really kind of lacking as to how best to regulate those activities in both the agricultural zone and also in our business zone. So it's an area that certainly could be um, refined. Um, unlike a lot of other rooftop type things, we make no exceptions for rooftop mounted solar installations, but we do for a lot of other things. Um, so once again, that's something we can talk about um, uh, at some point down the road. We, we regulate these in a section of your regulations 9.1, which also regulates cell towers and rooftop antennas. Most communities have a separate set of regulations for solar uh, installations. So maybe uh, once again, in the future, it's something we um, wanna think about. Uh, your regulations, your subdivision regulations, in addition to your zoning regulations have um, uh, primarily deal with um, not rooftop, but passive solar energy designs as it, as it relates to um, subdivision layouts. There's a statute. Peter, do you, Peter, do you want comments as you're going through this? Or maybe, to, maybe at the end. You want we'll me to talk to you sometime in the future when we can talk to you guys in the office? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much at the last section of this so that we can maybe start talking about specifics. So, um, as I don't I said, think you need that passive solar part. That bothers me. Well, considering we have very few new subdivision developments, I think it literally has no no, 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 bearing. Net, no net impact. So um, right. nevertheless, there's a yeah. statutory provision that requires uh, this That's a language. statutory yeah. thing yes. you're following? Okay. Yes, subdivision regulation shall make consideration for solar, passive solar design. You're going to make yeah, a developer go regulation. Huh? Yep, yep. So... Did you have some comments, George? Now would probably be the time I'm at the last two pages. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the okay. last one, the passive solar thing, I don't, I don't like it at all because you're requiring a developer to give all sorts of theoretical stuff in there. And, uh, you know, to get his subdivision through, come on. It, 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 we can only regulate these guys so that it gets, gets them a little discouraged or up go the cost of the lots in the housing. And that, that's what bothers me. I'll, I'll A, B, and C there, but 
I mean, you're, you're having them do something that I consider theoretical, nice, but, you know, you got to watch that stuff. That's all. Keeps, keeps I, I got a bunch of little things, that's all, but that, that was the main one. Okay. Keeps Ryan and I employed. So uh, as, as, uh, right. as we get to pages four and five, uh, the first one is at some point we might want to add some definitions. There are no definitions in your regulations. Uh, there are probably a few tweaks we should make uh, in the uh, residential zone, um, particularly as to uh, maybe how, if you want to, uh, you want to allow uh, ground mounted installations. Um, Good idea. So there's some other questions in the business zones. We make every um, installation in a business zone come in for a special permit. Um, that's not exactly a, probably the way to incentivize uh, business properties to, to, to convert over to solar. So that might be something we, we think about uh, making that uh, less onerous for uh, commercial uh, developers. I went, Peter, I went to look at two solar installations on my street of my neighbors. And I said, where are the physical parts of this? Because you've got yards and we're talking about it. They said, we don't have any. You know, so yeah. You know, I wonder what we're doing here at times. You know, so. well, the technology has really come a long way, so hmm. that's why. Yeah, these are ten years ago. No, five years, five or six. And one of the permits over here, one of them said. But you know what I'm saying is they don't have physical stuff out there. Their roofs and the solar installations there. And if they have to come into us because they're too high in the roof or something like that, you know, it's not, it's, that's the only issue I see. Where's Sam? Okay, so it's just, uh, I wanted to present this to you, food for thought. Um, your regulations do have some areas that could uh, uh, be refined. And, um, and <laughs> we've talked about this before. Uh, so maybe at a, uh, a future meeting, um, we can have this conversation in, in more detail and uh, make some decisions if you wanted to pursue those changes to accommodate these a, a little more effectively. Peter, are you going to research other towns' <laughs> regulations on them? I, I have a little bit as part of this effort. So we do have a, uh, a little inventory of um, some, some neighboring towns and, and how they do that. So I do have uh, uh, the ability to summarize that for you guys at, a, at another time. Yeah, because the maximum height of 18, 18 feet kind of scares me if someone can throw that panel in their backyard. Yes. <laughs> but interestingly uh, Peter, enough, I, I, I don't think we've had anyone actually yeah. make that kind of a proposal, but it is, it is a bit of a, 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 an open area in your regulation. Uh, Peter, uh, Tom, Tom Dean here. Yep. Um, I've got a couple of comments uh, on on this uh, areas to look at. Uh, I I think you're you're right uh, about making less onerous the requirement for uh, for commercial buildings uh, to uh, convert to solar power. Uh, I think that's that's very wise. That's probably the greatest uh, uh, undeveloped area. I would include uh, you know commercial structures as well as institutional structures such as schools, uh, you know, the town hall, uh, you know, uh, buildings of that nature offer great possibilities for uh, placing solar power. Um, also, take in, in addition to looking at what other communities uh, regulations may be on this area, uh, see if you can look into uh, some uh, some technological developments or, or areas of technology that are progressing uh, that uh, uh, that provide for um, uh, different kinds of solar panels. For example, about 15 years ago, I attended some conference where, conferences whereby uh, there was being projected that one could embed um, uh, solar collecting uh, uh, devices into shingles to have those interconnected and whether or not that would be uh, you know a part of these regulations or whether you would specifically accept that kind of technology from the impact of such regulations uh, things that, that could 
could be done with regards to solar power technology that doesn't look the way that current uh, solar panels look nowadays, which are, you know, even even the ones we've got are, are raised structures uh, that are roughly, um, uh, I think, around 20 inches by 30 inches in, uh, in in a rectangular form, and there are also maybe solar panels that I would hope to have in different shapes, such as triangles and the like. I remember uh, four years ago, I tried to have solar panels installed on my house, but because my roof uh, comes up to a pyramidal peak, I could not provide enough solar panels to justify the the expense of incurring uh, the adoption of that technology for my own purposes. But if one could have different shapes of panels uh, that would cover an adequate uh, square footage of the roof, that might pay off. Those panels may be of a slightly different kind of technological development than the solar panels that exist now. So those are, those are factors I, I would encourage uh, that we look at. And in any way that we uh, uh, try to uh, encourage this rather than acting as, as a negative force uh, you know, against the adoption of this technology, so long as, as it doesn't really have a, a real detrimental effect upon uh, you know, the, the way the town looks. Thanks for hearing me out. Thanks, thanks for the input. So, Rich, it looked like you were ready to make some comments. I was gonna make a, a suggestion um, that Peter move on to the status um, because I assume there's some timing associated with doing this in order to get certified. And is there anybody pressuring us to be certified? So the town council back in 2018 um, signed up for the sustainable CT program we have not had the uh, time uh, to, to devote to this. Um, so last year I started slowly chipping away uh, at it. Um, and we are at the point now where we uh, are, in, are planning to submit the application by the end of August for the uh, fall uh, certification round. Uh, so we've uh, come a long way since last year. Uh, I did provide you with a memo which um, attempts to summarize, assuming I can find it here. Which attempts to summarize, um, so there, there are just, I'll give you a quick summary. There's, a, uh, there's nine different categories, uh, basically categorized as uh, lo the local economy, um, natural resources, cultural uh, activities, planning, uh, transportation, uh, physical infrastructure, uh, public services, uh, housing, and then um, there's a, a general equity uh, category. So there's two levels of certification. One is the bronze level and the other is the silver level. We probably, um, if we can organize this in the next 10 weeks, two months, we could potentially get the silver uh, certification. Um, at this point, there are 48 communities. So when I checked it today, I, I wrote 47 on here that have gone through the certification process. Um, I think Glastonbury, Hartford, um, Portland, Middletown, some of those communities have gone through this uh, process already ahead of us. Um, the deadline is August 25th. Um, there are a couple of categories where we do uh, very well, uh, which you should should be aware of. One is the planning category. Uh, that's no uh, no reflection on me. I, I, I won't take any <laughs> any credit for that, and that's not why I'm why I'm saying it. But nevertheless, don't don't be so modest. Um, we get a boatload of points in that category if everything um, uh, pans out. 
your plan of development has a lot of good um, sustainability concepts in it. So you get a, a whopping 40 points there, uh, which is, I think, good for you to know. Your zoning regulations also have a whole bunch of sustainability categories there, which you get another 40 points. So those are, so those are some of our strengths. Also, uh, transportation, the, the whole uh, bike and pedestrian committee, the work that they've done uh, garners a whole, a uh, whole bunch of points uh, as well, 165 points there if everything uh, worked out. Your parking regulations, because they're very flexible um, and allow shared parking and things like that, uh, get you also uh, a lot of points. Um, so uh, those pages two, three, and four kind of summarize where we're going to do pretty well if we can pull all of the information together by the end uh, end of August. So I just wanted to give you uh, a little insight uh, into that as we uh, get closer to the end. So you're not, uh, not surprised um, if you hear about this. I wanted to at least give you the ability to see some of this stuff. Um, even some of the uh, training that you guys have gone to, the CFPZA uh, uh, annual conference, uh, get, you, you, you guys got some points for, uh, so you guys are in here as well. So, All right. Um, Rich, what do you got? It, it was just on the solar thing. I, I think this is a good start. And, you know, my only two thoughts are that the, uh, you know, the rooftop criteria that apply to residential probably could also be applied to commercial ones with equal you're freezing on us yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's one thing we really need to think about yeah i don't know what's going on yeah if you turn up the, your your uh, video your audio will become better it works fine until I start talking. <laughs> okay. Yeah, basically all I said was that uh, the yeah. residential criteria for rooftop probably could be usefully applied to the commercial ones and that I thought only the, the ground mounted ones were probably serious enough for us to want to see. Yeah, that's the first time I've actually noticed a technological improvement by taking off, you know, your, your data stream. Yeah, it, could, yeah. it takes it takes uh, data out of your uh, Wi-Fi system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good call. We miss you, Rich, but you heard you a lot better. <laughs> um, so, so Peter, why do we care? Well, why, we do why do you care? care? It's, yeah. yeah, it's um. I mean, it's kind of a, a, a report card, an assessment of, you know, things we do across the board for all. I mean, part of this process is I've, I've had to uh, interact with a, a bunch of departments that I don't normally interact with to see what they're up to, uh, to point out some things that we could certainly do better from a, from a resiliency and sustainability uh, point of view. I've learned quite a bit about um, some of the things that are, that are out there and some of the things that we don't do. Uh, that are food for thought going forward. Um, so it's more of a, an assessment process. Um, it does open up some funding uh, for us as well. They have a matching uh, fund program where you can apply for uh, funding to almost all of the categories that are mentioned there for various projects down the road. So uh, it also provides um, you know, that, that level of, of resource uh, as well. But it's really kind of a a look, a look at what we do well and what we don't do well. Uh, so it's, it's valuable from that uh, perspective as we go forward. Um, there are more and more things that are being thrown at municipalities that we have to do. We've recently been talking about the low impact development things and, and things we've got to change and adapt to. So uh, it's also uh, helpful from that point of view to uh, point out some of the things that are maybe coming down the road for us as well. Were you implying that we needed to get the zoning regs changed by this September-ish time frame? No, no, it's um, <clears throat> those are things uh, down the road. They really want us to, 
more or less assess ourselves and see what we do presently and what we don't do presently and then work on those going forward. So the August 25th deadline is really to pull together uh, the things that we do well, put it in a format that you know uh, they, they require to submit and then um, uh, they will review all of that and give us uh, a report back uh, and then we can talk about that uh, going forward. There are clearly some things though that we um, we do well and things that we don't do well that, you know, we, there's always room for improvement, I guess. So it was valuable from that perspective. I'm kidding here, Peter, but is your parking study in all, of all weather fields going to suffice for the whole town? Is, I didn't hear the last part of your question. I said, is the parking study you did for all weather fields going to suffice for the whole town? No, obviously it only applies to... Uh, <laughs> Old Weathersfield, but it also um, but pointed I, out yeah, the, that you guys that. have very flexible uh, rates <laughs> that you can use on a case by case basis and allows developers to make the case, um, right. you know, what works for them and what doesn't work for them. Uh, the thing we don't do is put maximums. You know, we have sort of the standard, you know, so many spaces per, but you've got a lot of flexibility so that if people want to approach you, make the case that they don't need a certain amount of parking based on some reasonable logic, then um, those are good things to have in your regulations. It minimizes, you know, asphalt and pavement and unnecessary, you know, amounts of parking and, and those kinds of things. So uh, that particular analysis was also pretty revealing. And I think you've got a lot of good things in those regulations that uh, other towns don't, don't have. So Peter, Peter, is the funding available if we don't have it in place for, say, projects that come to our town? You mentioned funding that was available because I know several of our uh, big commercial clients have put flat roof um, solar panels across the entire, you know, half the size of a football field, and it makes the property more valuable. But I just didn't know if, the, if that funding is uh, not available if we don't do this. No, there's a, there's a. They probably got the funding through what they call the C PACE program. Um, mm -hmm. We are a C PACE community. The council did that a couple of years ago. We haven't had a lot of businesses take advantage of it, but it, it's a separate uh, initiative from this initiative. And we are an eligible community. Therefore, our businesses can uh, apply for funds through that program. So it's a separate, a separate yeah. thing. But this, the sustainable CT organization has put together a whole bunch of resources that identify right. other things out there that I wasn't aware of. So it also provides uh, in specific areas um, that uh, we weren't necessarily aware of. So um, it does provide that as a resource. They don't, they don't necessarily uh, offer the money through the sustainable CT program, but they can connect you up with the partners that yeah. do. It's just, it's just a good thing for a commercial environment. Yes. A building worth more. Yes. And it pays, it pays for itself yep. in relatively short order in most cases. If, if the larger the building, the larger the payback. And then shorter the payback time. Peter, I would think you'd be approached more now with the COVID situation, with the issues with tenants struggling maybe, maybe not even opening. Maybe the uh, incentive to have this in place is sooner than later would be uh, timing really, really, really good. I'm happy you brought it to our attention today. I've heard of other towns uh, having this in place and, and it does ease some of the financial situation. As, as David said, it does complement value overall, it complements the tenant and complements the landlord and having them renegotiate any vacancies that might, might occur or extend occupancies a little bit further. So, uh, you know, this was a, a good effort, another one. Okay. Anything else, or shall we move on to uh, the minutes? Make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. George. Second. That was prompt. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Ryan, you took your mic, your uh, microphone, or you put your microphone on. Did you want to uh, jump in for something? I uh, just wanted to say aye. <laughs> <laughs> But you did it before that. Okay. Very good. But yeah, I was, yeah. I turned it off because my daughter came in the room. I just, I was, <laughs> I was scared. I was too scared. <laughs> uh, staff reports or uh, correspondence, Peter? 
get that siting council thing, anything's, you know. Peter, did we lose you? Mm -hmm. We think Peter froze there? Yeah, I know, is he just tricking us? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, well, listen, while, while he's uh, getting off and getting back on, um, uh, the town is going through the, the re-uppings. There's, there's, I presume, three of us that are being uh, reconsidered for positions. Um, I took, I did not put my hat back in the ring because I'll be moving in the next couple months. So uh, I, I don't know how many more meetings. Maybe Rich can tell me when the votes will take place, but I will not be re-upped because I didn't put my hat in the, in the ring, okay? So uh, when you do vote for, and I'm, I'm kind of guessing I won't be here for the vote for the next round of, uh, you know, positions and chairmanship, et cetera. So I don't know how many more meetings I'll be attending, period. Rich, can you speak to uh, when their council is voting? Uh, I don't know. But I presume it kind of goes with the new calendar year. And so this is the last meeting in the you know, fiscal year. Yeah, I, I just don't know whether, whether the council is going to cancel their first meeting in July or their second meeting in July and when the lists will be ready and that sort of thing. So, okay. Okay. So, um, Tom, Tom, with the summer months coming on, I want to thank you for all your efforts. You've been a great colleague and you put a nice sense of humor to the whole thing, a little more than Rich Roberts ever did. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, hopefully you'll be here for another couple of meetings and we can roast you a little bit. I agree with Tony. Yeah, we'll have special meetings. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Good. Yeah, um, we'll have at the end. So, so before most of you came on, I think um, uh, Peter was mentioning the fact that there may not be anything to the agenda for next meeting. Right. So I think he was implying, right, guys, that um, we should probably just take a vote and, and just cancel it, right? Okay. Correct. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Yeah, all right. I assume nobody, I guess you don't really need a vote, but I assume nobody has any problems with that. I assume that there will be a cancellation of the first my meeting. All right. Okay. Fine. Yep. Um, I'm guessing he's having difficulty coming back in. The recording, it says in the top that it's still, still recording. going, yeah. Right? Mm. Yep. Can we give him his performance evaluation then? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we just I don't know, Tony. He does pretty good. <laughs> yeah. He does pretty good. Got a lot of problems with you people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If there's nothing else, why don't we just wrap it up? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, did we do the minutes? Oh, yes, we, we did. did. We did the minutes. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. Yeah, right. And there was uh, this time it was Rich that was asleep at the wheel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's too dark to see the agenda. Well, you know, it's funny. For a while there, you were the ones who were looking bright, and, and Lisa was also doing it outside. It was really dark. <laughs> now it's, now it's reversed. She puts her lights on. Yeah, she got the lights on. Yeah, very right. festive. <laughs> <laughs> it was right. my Mother's Day present, the light. <laughs> <laughs> and he's coming back oh, on. Here's but, Peter. Oh. Here's Peter. Just just in time to say goodbye to him. All right. All right. Have a happy fourth. You there, Pete? Ooh. Nope. You're on mute. You're muted. I'm back again. We got kicked out again. There you go. All okay. right. Well, we're, we're about to take a motion to adjourn, and everybody was informed of the July, first July meeting being canceled. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can we make a motion, please? Motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you all. All in favor, say aye. 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 Good night. Good night. Happy Fourth of July. Happy Fourth of July. Happy Fourth of July. Yeah. Good luck moving, Tom. Oh, thank you. See y'all. See ya. <laughs>